All right, excellent. Listen, I'd like to thank everybody for sticking around for such a long time. We've been going on since 10 a.m. this morning. We're right now at our last, most uh, the best part of the show, the best part of the presentation. Um, John's obviously uh, could not be here, but we had the next best thing next to John, which is Peter. I'm going to introduce him in the next few moments. But uh, once again, ladies and gentlemen, the thing you got to remember most is that the reason why we do these events these cyber expos is to not, not to, you know, more or less to educate you how to learn how to trade. Why is it so important to learn? And the reason why we're all here taking the time on a beautiful day on a Saturday and having you guys here is to kind of educate you to make you understand that trading is a great job. It really is it's something that we all like to do, but you need a mentor. You need someone to teach you the right way. And that's why we put these events together. And that's why we're happy and, and very happy a lot of you are here. Um, most importantly, uh, you know, we'll be doing these every quarter, and uh, we have these events running all the time. So visit our website and uh, you know, to join for future ones. Now, uh, regarding about the raffle winner, once again, we'll announce it, uh, our raffle winner that won our full monitor trading system right after, uh, after Peter is done. But uh, I know Peter really took, uh, took the time out to be here today, so I don't want to take up too much of his time. He's going to go through a quick presentation, educate you more about the options and why, you know, options so important, teach you a couple of quick little strategies. I know you see him on CNBC every single day on Fast Money, but, the, you know, the thing is, is that there's only so much they can say on TV and what they can and can't say, but, uh, but it, it is a great opportunity and a great privilege to have him here. Uh, it's the first time he's, he's on Cyber Training University. And uh, once again, having almost a thousand of you being here today has been a great, great uh, privilege and an honor for having you guys to listen to us. So, without further ado, I don't want to take too much away from Peter. Peter, the stage is all yours. That Fausto, it's great to be with you guys, and um, and I and I'm looking forward to today. And and hopefully we all uh, uh, we all know what a beautiful afternoon it is, and it's a Saturday, and it's a sacrifice, but I think it just shows that a lot of people have a great deal of interest and um, and I think this is fantastic and John and I have been working together for a really long time I mean we've been brothers and we played football with each other register over time, today but, at uh, www.cybertradinguniversity.com uh, or call 877-70-CYBER on, uh, on the option trading floor and if you could go to the next slide give you a little idea every once in a while John is at uh, doing some work with CNBC actually from Chicago and when you see him he oftentimes, if he's on the CBOE floor, this is the trading pit where they've got some of the cameras set up there. That's the S&P 500 pit where uh, a great deal, a large percentage of the options trade on a daily basis. Neither of us really made, uh, made our money trading in the S&P pits, but that's one of the few pits left remaining today in the trading world where it's truly an open outcry type system, far more so than the rest of, of the markets that have now turned into What's really, and if we go to the next slide, you can see what the market has turned into. Uh, it's turned into an upstairs operation. It's everything that we, most of us now, are doing, including John and myself. We, we, we go down to the trading floors. John still does specifically in Chicago. Occasionally, I'm on down on the New York Stock Exchange. But that's just uh, mostly for looks. It's not because I'm trading down on the NYSE, and John's no longer trading down on the, on the trading floors in Chicago. He's... Just like myself, we both started to migrate up off of the trading floors as we'd seen what used to be. We were specialists for a long time on the trading floor where we made markets for people. And different style of trading altogether than what we all are now doing. Um, it's mostly just the investment banks and extremely large firms that remain as the bid and the offer in most of these stocks along with the rest of us that are, are placing our option orders in there now. And now it's much more of an offensive game. In the past, when you were a market maker, it was, it was always really playing defense and then trying to create an offensive strategy against what we had seen and trying to read the paper flows. That's something John and I have really been working on over the years, and it's something that we moved with our, our next company, Option Monster. We moved into the, the world where we created systems that help us see what we used to see when we stood on those trading floors, when it used to be that great open outcry. And that was just a, a, a great atmosphere, a lot of fun. And if you were aggressive and quick, you could do pretty well down there. And now the, the game has changed significantly, so we're all upstairs together. So I'm with you guys when you're, uh, when you're moving around in the markets and you're trying to see what you're trying to see. We're all seeing it 
in exactly the same time in exactly the same way and uh, and hopefully we uh, we're able to create some positions and some of the things that I'm going to be going over today and if we could go to the next slide it's it's about leverage and and a lot of people look at the options world and I think it's completely something that has been missed for a long time that that options are risk I actually look at options as reducing risk and it's about creating some leverage but giving yourself an opportunity to be in many of the different names that uh, that trade these days in particular when you talk about what are some of the names in the in the stock market these days that people talk the most about the names that always seem to come up on a consistent basis are Apple Google IBM pops in there you t you start to look around and, and a lot of the names that that people consistently talk about on CNBC and all of the rest of the the financial networks are really high dollar stocks so most of us all of us I would say have a very difficult time getting ourselves positioned into being able to compete and trade in a lot of these high dollar value stocks that are trading in excess of fifty dollars a share on up obviously up to the, the Googles of the world that are trading at eight hundred dollars a share and even some of the the in-between names that have a lot of volatility that we're all looking at whether it's Amazon or Netflix or intuitive surgical there are a myriad of names out there but so the options world in my opinion is not about uh, putting on more risk actually for me it, I've always viewed it as taking off some of that risk but putting on with some leverage to give yourselves an opportunity so if we go to the next slide looking at IBM it's hundred and ninety four dollars a share I think this screenshot now John put together these screenshots so I apologize if if uh, if I'm not exactly sure on the dates but I believe this one is exactly from Friday's close so this gives you an idea of at least the ballpark of where IBM was trading so at hundred and ninety four dollars a share most of us would not be in a great position to be able to use ourselves and use the option well use the stock rather for uh, the ability to actually get in and out of IBM you're talking about a thousand shares would take up hundred ninety four thousand dollars so that doesn't really bode well for most of us to be able to have to have that much money allocated to one stock just for that opportunity so if we go to the next slide as we look at a stock like IBM there are ways that people could could uh, approach a stock like this and a lot of different strategies and this one that John's put up here is something all I want you to focus on when you look at this particular slide is the return on the investment of 2.6 percent and that's going to take you 56 days in which to do this when you're looking at this trade and you can see right in front of you exactly where the prices are the strikes that John selected out here the June 195 put and it's against the stock so that would be the kind of a position that somebody could have on if you go to the next slide however you can see the stock replacement we're going to just really focus on a couple of strategies today because I know it's a Saturday and I know it's gotten long it started at 10 a.m. and people are are looking around and probably deciding on what they'd like to do for the rest of the afternoon but while we're here take a look at this stock replacement strategy and this is something where again as I, as I mentioned earlier you're reducing some of your risk and you're actually creating an opportunity where you've got tremendous leverage and you're able to compete you're able to be involved in a stock like an IBM so in this particular case John selected these January of 2014 so he's going out several months obviously to get out to the January strikes the month and you're getting out to January and that's the third Friday expiring option where you're buying the 180 call so you're fourteen dollars in the money you're paying a little bit of an excess premium because you're buying those strike calls along with the time premium that's involved and so you can see that's going to cost you to buy ten of those that's going to cost you nineteen thousand four hundred dollars but you're also going to create a buy right out of this by selling these June 195 calls and the present June 195 calls are trading right around the ballpark in between the bid and the ask around five dollars and fifteen cents so when you look at that you say to yourself well what am I really doing here I've, I've created a position where I've got a covered call I've gotten myself out there and I've put on this buy right but I've been able to do this buy right by doing so I didn't have to put out the hundred ninety four thousand dollars and yet I've got on the sort of a position that I would want to have on to be able to put myself into position to have a buy right strategy on an IBM and give myself an opportunity for some gains now your total outlay in this particular 
strategy of this buy right and this stock replacement using those leap options in this case to be able to buy that is actually $14,250. So you're putting yourself in the same kind of a position to be able to leverage yourself into an option, all option position without having to have a position in the stock whatsoever. These are the kinds of things that when we're, when we're looking around and we're looking for opportunities, why not give yourself a, a, the potential for return on investment? You're talking about $14,000 out there to be able to get yourself a similar sort of a rate of return, but without putting down the $194,000. So that's something that's really exciting for us because when we're looking around, we're all about trying to find opportunities. You still have some risks, obviously, with those calls that you've bought, those deep in the money calls. But your total risk, if indeed IBM, for instance, imploded, you would lose the entire 14250 But once you've lost that, you cannot lose any more. So that's something else that you got to keep in mind as you're looking at this trade. As the stock, if it were to fall out of bed and suddenly, for whatever reason, was cut in half, and if you think that's unlikely, which I do, it's not completely out of the plausibility of things because despite the fact that the valuations right now in IBM look pretty cheap, they give you a good dividend, I would just point right away to Apple and the fact that Apple went from 710 underneath $400 a share in a pretty rapid way. So that's exactly the type of thing that you, you would be defensing against. You wouldn't have the same sort of a risk position on by having an all option position in this case with this stock replacement strategy that you've put on with these deep in the money call options that are way out there into January of 2014. So these are the kinds of things that when people are asking us why are options so incredible to you, these are parts of the reasons why. It's also one of the fastest growing industries that you can find in financials right now because as we got through 2009 and 2010, a lot of what people were looking for, obviously leverage being one of them, was taken away. A lot of the opportunities was taken away. But if you look at the stock volumes, they have been slowly sort of evaporating over time. But you look at option volume, it's just can increased year after year after year. And I think a lot of that is due to the fact that you can still provide yourself some leverage. I think people are also getting far more educated than they once were. And with that education, they see opportunity. And I'm not just talking about retail investors. I'm talking about institutional investors, hedge fund managers. If anybody's been following what's been going on over the last three, four, five years with the biggest names in the industry, Warren Buffett, for instance, before he bought Burlington Northern, Warren Buffett was positioning into Burlington Northern with some monster positions in the stock, but he was also doing it with options along the way. And if you look at in Netflix, for instance, recently, Carl Icahn, he put on some massive positions using the options as part of not just the leverage, but also just giving him an, an opportunity to sort of put himself into the stock without having to put it out there to the public because he was doing it through the options rather than the stock. And eventually, as it, as it started to improve off that $60 number and ran to the upside, then suddenly we start to find out how a lot of the positioning and how large a position Carl Icahn really was putting on in Netflix, an unbelievable run to the upside for him. And you just go across many of those big names that people look at as, well, these guys are very risk averse, and yet they're using options as well. So I find all of that exciting for the industry and exciting for us, and it's why we work so hard on the educational opportunities, and hopefully people are taking these opportunities to, to find out how can I do some of these things that some of these pros are doing well, in some cases, these are exactly some of the trades that people are putting on. I'm going to go to the next strategy on the next slide here. It's, we're looking at Amazon, and Amazon is one of these stocks, and you can see it by the charts, pretty volatile. You can see this range that seems to go from about 250 to about 275, and you look at it back to, to February, and this chart really does show it well, how it can be a pretty volatile stock, and it probably can shake some people around and maybe shake some of their confidence at times. But this is something that John's referred to for a long time called the CPR. And it's, it's a way to revive something after it's taken a pretty good hit to the downside and you're, you're giving the stock a little bit of this CPR. You're trying to revitalize this. And 
this is a really interesting, and, and it's something that John's been doing for years. I do this a little, not much as much as John does, but I think it can be a great strategy. And if you go to the next slide, you can see kind of what's going on here. It, and and, and the, the headline of the slide is a little misleading. It says doubling down with no additional risk. Well, I'm not, I don't mean that that's misleading, but in this particular case, as it's formatted for you, just to be very clear, you're not necessarily doubling down at this point in time. What you're doing is you're saying, okay, it's taken a pretty big move to the downside in Amazon from that 275, you're back towards that 250, 255 level. And so as you can see, and this is one of, this is exactly what a trade ticket looks like on the, on the trading platform that we created, Trade Monster. It's exactly what the trading ticket would look like. And you can see this, you're buying the, the near term, these are Julys, the 255 calls, and you're selling twice as many of the Ju July 265 calls. So what have you created? Well, you've give, given yourself a little bit of risk to the upside if this stock were to run. However, you've also been buying the 10 of these January, going out once again, giving yourself some time, and going out and buying a fairly deep in the money call, replacement for stock once again, but now you've got that call that's going to act very similar to how the stock's going to act on the upside and still with some reduced risk to the downside if things were to fall apart. But you've got all of that upside that you would be able to ride with on these deep in the money calls for these Januaries. So now you've got your, your version of your, your 10 or 1,000 shares of stock. You've also got these July 255 calls, which again, that's your opportunity for the upside. And then you've hedged yourself by selling these 20 265 calls. Now, if you go to the next slide, there's one problem on this slide, and John must have been moving quickly when he did this. You can see that July strike. It's not the 280s. Those are exactly the, the, the options we were talking about on the previous slide. Those are the 265s. So ignore the fact that that says the t sell 20 July 80 calls. Those are the July 265 calls. But you get the idea. You're paying $41. Sounds like a lot of money, and it is. But you're paying $41, and that's going to be your stock, essentially, in Amazon. So rather than having to put out $254,000, you're putting out $41,000 in this particular case. But that's giving you your stock in Amazon as a stock replacement. Then you're also buying those 10 July 255 calls. Those are going to cost you $13. So now you've got long stock equivalent, so you've got your equivalent of 1,000 shares, 10 of those. You've got your long July 255 calls, which are basically right at the money. The stock's trading 254.81, so call it at the money, these July 255s. So you're buying the 10 deeps, you're buying these other 10, the July 255s. So that's the cash outlay that you're really putting out there. But you're also selling 20 of those 265 calls. By doing so, that 860, obviously becomes $17.20. So your total output is right there in front of you. You subtract all these numbers you come up, you've put out there, and if you go to the next slide, you've got your total risk out on the table. Now, here's the example. If the stock is unchanged and it's $255 on July ex expiration, those January calls, you're going to lose about $2. On those July 255s, they're worth zero. The July 265, the 55s are worth zero. The 265s are also worth zero. So you've got your credit because you were able to take in the $4.20 at the end of the day. With the $2 loss, that means you made $2.20. So you made $2,200 on 10. And if we go to the next slide, now, the stock actually did improve, but it only improved by about five bucks. But here's how you start to see some of the movement that's going to occur. Those deep in the money calls are going to move not quite as fast as the stock. The stock's up five dollars. They're going to move up about four dollars. But you're going to get the full, full five dollars from the 255s going to 260. You're going to be able to get that five dollars, and the 265s are going to go out valued at zero once again. So then when you go through, and here's all the numbers from the previous couple of slides here, when you go through all of this, you're going to see those July 
265 calls that went out worthless that were $17.20 are going to really add to your portfolio here. So when it's all said and done, you can see with the investment that we started off that seemed pretty high, and it is, but it's Amazon we're talking about. It's a $254 stock. You started off with an investment of $36,800, and you've actually taken $13,200 out of this trade on the 36800 investment, and it took you 84 days. So that's not such a bad thing, and that's because you had an opinion that Amazon was either going to sit or hopefully start to move to the upside. All you did was get a $5 move to the upside. Had you bought 1,000 shares of stock, you'd have made $5,000 but you would have also put down $255,000 to do that. In this particular example that we're going through here, you've got 36,800 invested and you're taking out 13,200. So when I talk about rate of return on investment, that's exactly what I'm talking about. That's exactly what John and I look at. We're always looking for opportunities that can put us into stocks as inexpensively as possible, but giving us the opportunity to be able to get the kind of moves that hopefully we can, you know, we're all, all looking for as much as possible, obviously, in a lot of these stocks. If you go to the next slide, now you're curious probably what happens when you're short those 265s and it goes through there. Well, here's where you've, you've actually got all the numbers right in front of you. And this, at some point, you cap out on how much you can make because you've bought a total of 20 calls and you've sold a total of 20 calls. So at some point you stop making money despite the fact that the stock could really catapult to some incredible levels. Well, you are giving yourself a cap, but take a look at how you're doing even at 270. You're going to have those 255 calls. Now they're worth 15. Obviously, you can see those January calls are moving pretty close to as fast as the stock is to the upside from where we bought them. And you can see those short calls, well, shoot, now you're losing $5 twice, so you've lost a total of $10. But now, on a $15 rally, you've made $22,200 on a, an investment that you're talking about. You put a total of $36,000 into. So not so bad. And, and you've given yourself that opportunity for some of this upside. So as you're looking at different ways to approach some of these very, very expensive dollars. But this doesn't just apply to the $50 and the $250 and the $300 stocks. These kinds of strategies are something that John and I very frequently will employ. And John, more, like I say, more, more often than I do. But these are the kinds of strategies that in stocks where we suddenly have an interest, we're trying to figure out, OK, how can we use the options to be able to leverage ourselves or in some cases, give yourselves a little bit of torque to the upside, but be willing to give up some of, some of that upside. Because in Amazon example, there is a point where you stop making as much money. At some point, if that stock goes to 300, you've capped out how much you can make. So that's something to be aware of. And a lot of people get frustrated by that. But that's just part of the, the, the willingness to say, hey, look, I'm going to willing to put on this much of a risk for this much of a reward, and I want to reduce some of the initial risk, so that's what you have done. That extra selling of those calls against that position did cap us out. And if it, I think somebody is asking something about if the stock were to crumble. Well, if the stock were to crumble, yes, you're going to lose your investment. And you're going to lose, at some point, a lot less in that investment if the stock were to completely crumble. You would lose less in the investment than having just nakedly bought the stock itself. And that comes at a specific point. But the, the idea behind this is, at 255, you've decided you're bullish on this stock. I'm not saying that I am right now. I'm just saying that this is a strategy that can be implemented under the circumstances that you like Amazon at these levels, and you think that Amazon has at least potential to hold and potential maybe even to go to the upside, and in those scenarios that we just went through, you have an opportunity to make money in all of those scenarios. So that, that's something that's also very exciting when we're looking at the options world and trying to give ourselves some opportunities along the way. Those are the kinds of things we're looking for. So in that first example of the day, we were talking about stock replacement. In the second example of the day, we're talking about the CPR or 
stock has completely fallen out of bed, not completely, I guess, in Amazon's case, but fallen out of bed to some some degree, and, and it's looking at that chart on the lower end of its of its uh, levels where it has found support recently, at least in 2013, and you're looking for an opportunity on how would I be able to approach this at this point going forward. So those are some of the examples of, of things that John and I very frequently talk about and wor work together on, and, and we're always looking for some of these opportunities out there. But particularly recently, it's been in a lot of these stocks where they're newsy stocks, very high news related stocks, and they all seem to be, at least right now, seem to be trading at high dollar value. So how is there an opportunity for the common man and the retail investor like all of us are at this point in time? This is, this is some of the strategies that we try to implement. So with that, uh, Fausto, uh, it's, it, it's up to you. If we'd like to take some questions, I know it's been a long day for everybody. It's, uh, I know it's pushing towards 3.30 here on the East Coast, but I, I'd be willing to either answer questions or we, if you have any anything you'd like to talk about, I'm more than happy. Sure, no problem, Peter. I mean, it, 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 once again, thanks for coming. And, uh, you know, yeah, it's been a long day for all of us. I know it's been a Saturday. It's probably one of the first nice days that we had here in New York. It's been awfully close. Are you in New York or are you in, in, you're back in Chicago? No, you know, I moved out here to New York back in 2000 and, um, oh, shoot, I guess I 2007. When Fast Money, I, I just came out to do the CNBC's Fast Money show just for a couple of days to fill in, and the next thing I know, I was, they were uh, sort of recruiting me, and eventually by, by June of 2007, I had moved here, so I, I'm a full-time East Coaster, but I actually live in Connecticut. I'm, I'm just on the border, just north. Of, beautiful day, though. Beautiful <laughs> blue skies and 70 degrees. I can say this. You're definitely smarter than your brother. Cause I don't know how your brother goes back and forth to Chicago, back and forth, though. I, I mean, uh, I, I criticize him and, and get on him all the time that he made the wrong decision staying there, but, but he's terrific. I, I'll tell you what, he is a Chicago guy through and through. He's been there since... He played for the Chicago Bears back in 81, and he, he loves Chicago. He's like a mini version of the mayor of Chicago back there. So he, he loves it. He absolutely loves it. But the two of us have, you know, it's been a tough week for us because as exciting as the markets have been, we've, we've also been very actively. I do a lot of work with both ESPN and with NBC Sports. And with this draft that's been going on, it's been really exciting watching, uh, watching how things move in the offseason in the NFL as well. You know, probably everybody's, probably everybody's going to ask you this question. I'm going to ask you personally. Sure. Being a football player yourself and being the draft, because I was also I was down there at the draft, by the way. Uh, my, my good friend uh, just got – I'm a big Jeff fan, so, uh, you know, uh, I was down there for the draft. But what, being a player, who, who's your favorite team? Uh, boy, that's a tough one. I can tell you this. The house was a little bit split and a few years ago for the Super Bowl. It was really difficult. My wife grew up in – we both grew up in the Bay Area of California, but she grew up a Raider uh, fan through and through. She's silver and black every Sunday, oh, and geez. they had, had a lot of tough years. But uh, I, I really enjoyed – I played for the Vikings and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and um, I think if you put a – a gun for it to my head to make me choose, I'd probably have to side with my Buccaneers. I really enjoyed it. Great, great team, great management. Uh, it's different management now. We had a gentleman named Hugh Culverhouse, but I, I love my Bucks still. <laughs> That's good to hear. Well, let me, let me just ask you a couple of questions. A lot of great questions. I know you have to go. I'm going to probably answer about, about for about five or ten minutes. A um, couple of things that I, I know everybody, once again, being at Cyber University, we train thousands, tens of thousands of people, and they all ask the same questions, comes to options, and the thing they always want to know is, um, if I was to start trading options, you know, as a beginner, because there are a lot of people here, beginners, and there's a lot of people that do train, and there's a lot of people that, you know, listen to everybody out there learning how to trade options, and some people just confusing. I mean, there's a million ways to trade options, Peter, but if someone's to start out, what's the simplest way or a simplest option to trade if they wanted to get involved? Well, the most popular still to this day has been forever since practically, I guess, maybe since options were created. But uh, And they've been around a lot longer than people think, even before the option exchanges. But um, it's got to be a buy right. Uh, 
and, and the reason I say that is it, it makes a lot of sense because most investors in this world, including myself, tend to be long the stock market and in some fashion or another. Uh, they may have at times be a little less, but whether it's a 401k or whether it's the, just um, folks that are involved in the market in, in their own way, they own stocks. They might own an Exxon Mobil or they could potentially own a GE. And a lot of the time, obviously, people are are in very steady, solid companies, makes a lot of sense, and they're, and they're trying to figure out, well, how could I do anything with options to kind of enhance what I'm getting right now? And I frequently have done this over the last couple of years in a couple of stocks because even though people think that, that John and I are, are sort of these crazy option traders, um, I think that's far from the truth. We, we trade options, we certainly read the markets as much as we can, but there are some positions that I've had for long periods of time uh, where I have used them as, as buy right positions. In other words, I own the stock, and like I say, the most common trade still to this day is when the options give you enough premium, I'm willing to sell a little bit of that upside. And what people, you know, more often than, than not forget is unless it gets exercised against you, the, the, the option that you have sold, the call option above the stock, Unless it, get it, it, unless it gets exercised, you can buy that back, even if you're taking it back for a loss, because the reality is you haven't probably lost a whole lot on the option. You've had the increase on the stock, and so it's really not the worst case scenario that people think. So if, if there's the most common thing, I would say it's the buy right, it, because more, more folks out there than not are long stocks, and they're using maybe an option to try to kind of enhance their yield. In most cases, people are already getting nice stocks that have pretty solid yields, particularly in this day and age where you're getting 3 4 5% depending on what stock it is and what particular sector. And if there's some premium in some of these options and you can even do it three, four times in a year, you can enhance those yields. You can actually get some pretty nice returns without having any additional risk on in a lot of stocks. Well, and the opposite, Peter. Now that now you kind of explain that for the beginners, because I, I used to look at everyone, you know, starting out trading. Even when I teach people how to day trade stocks, is that I look at everyone, you know, I, I understand the basics, supply and demand, the bid and ask, and just understand, like you said, the American dream is obviously thinking long, never never thinking short. But now there are people that I've noticed that take trading and options to a different level because they don't know any better. And what is your main recommendation? To, to options to stay away from things that 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 does cause a big failure rate. And we all know that trading is a very big failure rate, and the reason why I tell people it's a big failure rate because who really taught you other than being self-taught? Right. But there's so many ways of trading options, and if there's something you can make a recommendation, tell people what not to do, not to trade. What would you tell them? I would say that under uh, the the biggest problem is, and you you, you essentially are hitting it on, on it through your question, which is a lack of really understanding. And I and I think it's folks like you and and hopefully ourselves with some of the education. I mean, if if somebody's ever on any of our couple of sites, either our Option Monster or our Trade Monster site, um, they will see very high up that the most important thing we've got on our board is education and. You guys do a great job. Obviously, there's, there are so many folks out there that are, are doing a, a very good job, I think, in educating people and having an understanding. And I think the biggest failure rate comes from folks that jump into the options without an understanding of, okay, what are my risks? What are the risk parameters? And what, what am I really, what is my risk that I want to have on? I mean, it's one thing to say, Sure, I love this down at these levels, so I'm going to sell. The big, the scariest thing I can see out there are the people who sell puts on a stock that they are unsure if they really want to own it. Uh, because there's a reason why the stock is likely down, and maybe it's maybe it's oversold. That could be the possibility. And but oftentimes I see people selling puts without the full understanding that hey, I'm going to own that stock if the stock continues to fall to the downside and somebody decides to exercise it. I could own that at a much higher level than I really fully understand and want to own it at. So I think it's something where it, it, people have to really understand what does it really mean if I sell puts and what does it really mean if I do some of these strategies that have more risk on them than others. So 
John and I very frequently, uh, as proven by that CPR, there is, you've limited your downside risk, but you've also limited the amount of profits you're going to make to the upside, but we're, but we're okay with that. And, and that's, a, that's fine. But some of the risks that I think that people, you know, they put their foot into at times is they're doing a one by two. In other words, they're buying 10 and selling 20. Well, they're not hedged once they reach through a certain level. And that can get pretty painful. And the folks that sell puts without really understanding that that could potentially be a stock put to them and suddenly they're owning it at a much higher level. That's another mistake where I think people just don't fully, it's not that they're being foolish or greedy, it's just that they don't fully understand, and that's something that we all have to do a better job to make sure that people really fully understand what does it mean when I do some of these trades. You know, exactly what you said is, like, cause I, I was a market maker, you know, on the NASDAQ, and exactly what you said, Peter, is what, what my mentors always taught me, and I hope everybody here understands that. Good traders, you know, we, we don't look how much money we make. We look how much money we can lose because you don't make any money until you sell it. Right. So getting into a position, you got to look at the risk first because it's a business. You're treating it like a business. And you know what? I, it has been so many questions coming across the chat, and, you know, and that's one of the things why a lot of people are here. And I wanted to get, to get to them. I know you don't have too much time, Peter, but one of the most popular questions that keep coming up in the chat room, people keep asking about the options margin. Now, could you explain to them a little bit about, is there margin? I mean, in day trading, you know, you have the $25,000 day trading rule, and that's one of the reasons why a lot of people like to trade options. But is there a margin requirement? And, and if there is, what are the rules to explain it? Because that looks like it's been a very popular topic in the chat that people are asking. Right, and, and I think a lot of that, and I am not great with the back office side of, of, of the options world because I, I guess just because of the fact of where I started from, which was really in the front office, being on the trading floors themselves. So um, I, I can tell you that uh, with each uh, one of those, and I know a lot of people are using various online brokers throughout. Uh, there, there are so many these days that that's a huge competition level. We're involved in that as well. Um, each individual, I would call, that's, that's one of those questions, I think, when somebody has a list of questions that they want answered, when I go to whoever my online broker is, that would be one of my first questions. Okay, what are my marginal requirements? And I would go through each individual question, have them down. I mean, we have a paper trading on our, on, on our site that is live, active, and my only criticism that I ever tell people about the paper trading is you have to be honest with yourself when you're going through the paper trade that when the pain gets to be really painful, what would you really do if that were money in place right now? It, it, because as much as I love the paper trading account that we have, and I know other people have, have started to do that as well now, but you have to be very honest as you're, as you're going through these trades and make, make decisions that you really would make if there was really money at risk in these paper trading. And I'm a huge proponent of how great these, these paper trading accounts are because it gives people an opportunity to watch and understand the, all of the different Greeks, uh, obviously, that are happening with their options, the deltas and the thetas and gamma and everything that goes on with an option and understand, wow, you know, the reason, even though the stock went up and my call didn't perform the way I would want to was, I paid a little bit too much in the volatility. I didn't get enough movement out of the stock. And they can see that happening when they see the paper trade. And they can understand, wow, that's one mistake that I need to understand so that when I'm really trading, I don't make that mistake. But I think there are a number of questions when people uh, open up their accounts that they really want to get very clear before they actually start trading with their individual online broker. You know, Peter, I tell people that all the time and, and the students, too, about paper trading. Um, back when I originally started, back in 94, uh, with today's technology back then, we all had to do it by writing on a piece of paper. And that's, that's where the phrase, as some of you don't know, that's what paper trading really means. Um, we used to write it down on a piece of paper, pretending we really bought it, and that was like the ticket back then. Yeah. But now with today's execution systems, like the ones that you guys offer at uh, Options Monster, I mean, it's, it's great. But, but everybody here has to understand, uh, Peter, that paper trading is only as good as you treating it like real money. 
Yeah. You know, so when you're going out there and you're trading with that paper trading account, you got to treat it like it's real money. And then when you're ready to trade with real money, I tell everyone, don't even, like, I never tell anyone, don't worry about the money. The money will come later. Start with one stinking share yeah. of an option. Try to make money with that because once you start putting, and forget about the ticket charge. That's mm -hmm. the least of your problems part of doing business. But if you can't make money with one share, there's no way you're going to be going out there and trading, you know, 10 contracts or 50 contracts or because you got, oh, but I got $100,000 in my account. I could buy $100,000 worth of options. Mm -hmm. That's where people make their mistake. But once again, paper trading is very, very important when it comes to education. And I think um, and, and, well, I'm, I'm just, sorry. Go ahead. No, I'd just like to say this is on that same topic, and I think you're dead on on that, by the way. Um, one of the other biggest mistakes outside of not really fully understanding the risks of a trade that somebody's putting on, I think the other biggest mistake that I see frequently out of people, and I mean uh, almost as frequent as I get asked what do I think of Apple, uh, the, the most frequent mistake I see is people want to trade too large uh, for their own, uh, to your point. I was just saying that myself earlier today when I was doing a presentation. It's amazing. I, I get people who will come up to me at, 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 at events that we put on because we do these, uh, you know, live events, you know, three, four times a year. And people will come up and say, well, you know, I was in this position and it really hurt and, and, and they go through it. And eventually I find out as they start speaking to me longer yeah, you know, I bought 500 of these, and I look at them, and I'm thinking, my gosh, that's a very large position. You put an enormous amount of exposure of your entire portfolio on in this particular trade, and that you don't need to do that. And so uh, I, I think that's another you know mistake is that people want to trade larger because they get the leverage and because it's it's less money than doing the stock, and that's not really the way you want to think about it. I. I, I tell people, look, if you were going to buy the equivalent of a thousand shares of the stock, whether it's it's one option like you used, or maybe it's ten, but at least you have a reduced number there of some sort that's more realistic. Because my guess would be, people aren't going to go out and oftentimes buy fifty thousand <laughs> shares of a stock or a hundred thousand shares of a stock, so they don't need to do that stock equivalent in the options just because of the the numbers add up. It doesn't. It, that part, it's it's less ego, and I can tell you that you will lose your ego pretty quick along with your uh, money as you get slapped around if you're if you're trying to trade bigger than you really are comfortable with. By the way, Peter, uh, there's been a lot of people asking about you know learning and education. I'm just going to put a quick link in there really quick for some of you. Um, Peter's actually doing a very big present. Uh, they're doing a very big uh, conference on June 7th and 8th. It's called the Street Monster. And uh, they, they, they do these every quarter. It's a great presentation of learning with the top speakers and, and really learning the truth, uh, meeting, meeting them face to face and telling you really how it is. You got to remember this. You know, here, you know, we're running, a, we're doing an expo tonight. I mean, I know a lot of you here have been, been here early, been here for a long time, but there's only so much you can retain. Good traders, everyone, never learn enough. I learned something new. I was, you know, Peter, I was with your brother six months ago, and he says, Fausto, there's something you just taught me. I didn't even know about it. You know, we always learn something new. And that's, and, and same thing with everyone here. You know, being self-taught, everything. You always learn something and surround yourself. So if you could tell everyone just really quick uh, about the new event, the event that, that's coming up here in New York, your, the Street Monster, and the and, uh, link is up there. If anybody wants to register and find out more about it, feel free. Well, it's, and thank you. It, it's very nice of you. Um, it's, it's a great event because it's similar to what we've done around the country, what we call our ILAMs, the Invest Like a Monster, um, and that's, it's really similar to one of those, except for the fact that it's the street monster because we've added the folks from the street. In other words, Jim Kramer is going to be one of the people up there presenting, and uh, Stephanie Link, one of his traders who's frequently on now television, and she is one of the folks in charge of Jim's uh, charitable trust fund. So I think it's really a, a great event and a, and a great opportunity for people to come up and and find out as much as they can. Obviously, I think it's over a couple of days. It's a Friday, Saturday in June 7th and 8th. It's, it's an exciting opportunity, and people, you, you'll find that everybody is available to you for questions and all that type of thing, and it's in New York City, which I think is great. I think on Friday there's an opportunity to go to the New York Stock Exchange, walk around, see some of that, and then um, Saturday just a, an entire day of, 
different folks from my brother John to Guy Adami. Uh, matter of fact, if people remember a guy named Jeff Mackey who's now on Yahoo Finance and does a great show called Breakout, I believe it's called, on Yahoo Finance. Jeff used to be on the uh, Fast Money Show. There's just a whole lot of folks, Jim Cramer and Stephanie speaking, and then we've got some folks who uh, are covering on the charts as well. So it's really a, a broad base of just about everything, and, um, and I think it's a lot of fun, and hopefully people can get, as you said, I, you never stop learning. I, I continue to learn something um, at various areas and various events that I go to as well. So it, you never stop. You never want to stop. You're always starving for more, and, uh, and I'm no different than anybody else. I'm always willing to learn. I think you always learn a lot just from these market conditions that are happening. Yeah. Every time there's a there's a another bubble or internet bubble or a financial crash of 2008, whatever the internet bubble, whatever it is, you always learn something new. So for everyone here, uh, definitely if you can get the opportunity to come to New York and and meet up uh, with some of the top speakers and learn them, I mean it's it's highly recommended. What we're gonna do is uh, we'll take one more last question and then we're gonna end it and we'll let Peter go. Uh, once again, we will have that email for all of you to register for the option con conference. Feel free to go there. Once again, it's an investment for yourself to learn and to see these people face to face. Listen, you watch them on TV all day. There's only so many hours in the day they could and educate you. But when it really comes down to it, you know, definitely put the time uh, on the side and really learn how to do it. Uh, one last question. Let me see. Uh, anyone have any last minute questions? I'm probably get a thousand people chatting in there. Uh, is the ECB interest rate cut price in the market? Uh, you know, uh, it's it's really interesting. I follow all of the global news as much as just about anybody else, and I and I and I find it all fascinating. I find it extremely important to uh, to a degree, but. I think at the end of the day, we all trade the markets that were delivered, and I and I think that as we watch these markets over the last couple of years, uh, how many economists and so forth have predicted that that things were going to happen based upon what either the ECB or our own Fed has uh, some of the decisions made, and they've been dead wrong. And because of that, I'm always cognizant of what's going on with these decisions that are being made, and, and I look at them as closely as I can. But at the end of the day, I look, and, and this is the God's honest truth, because, and it's not just because of this, the options world is where I am, but I find that the options really are one of the greater predictors of the sentiment along with at least the expectations that are happening in the market. I'll tell you the number of times where uh, we've, we've heard either negativity, usually it's more on the negative side of some of the reaction to some of this, and yet everything we're seeing is to the positive side, So uh, and vice versa. So I, I think just based on that, and I, and I used this example just yesterday on, on the Fast Money Show at halftime, when I look at the markets right now, we've had four closes above the moving averages the entire year for the volatility index of the 200-day moving average. And, and what that says to me is that there's enough protection right now in the markets that people aren't feeling the squeeze to be pushed out of markets that they seem to want to be invested in. And as long as we've got the Fed back giving us that uh, sort of put option to the downside, and I think the idea that the volatilities remained low so f for the first three, four months of the year, that people have been able to position themselves to have protection to the downside, um, it sure seems to me that, uh, and I'm not saying that we don't have any shot to go get hit pretty hard to the downside, but we certainly haven't seen that yet, and it certainly hasn't manifested itself for more than hardly a single session this year. So I think, uh, you know, I pay attention to all those different numbers that are coming out, but uh, at the end of the day, I look to see what those huge investors are looking at and expecting and the sentiment coming from that, and so far, it has been uh, sort of a business as usual approach, but that that can change. But so far, that's been, been what we've been seeing. Pete, thank you so much for coming. Uh, Pete, it's been always an honor, a privilege to having you on, and and you brought you guys do a great, great service uh, doing what you're doing on uh, on TV and educating the world, and just keep up the good work. And look forward to see you in New York. Uh, and everyone, once again, to register for that event, make sure you definitely check it out. And uh, like I said, it's. The, 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 the cheapest trade, and this is my highly recommendation to all of you, the cheapest trade you're going to make is get yourself educated. That's the cheapest trade. Yeah. Uh, Peter, 
Thanks again. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much. Really enjoyed it, and, and look forward to seeing you guys again at some point in the time in the near future. Thanks, everybody. All right, so that's Peter Nigerian from Option Monster, um, also on Fast Money. Now, um, what I'm going to do right now, ladies and gentlemen, one last minute, I'm going to actually, there's a, I know everybody's been patient, and for the raffle, let me just get the, uh, the drum roll, and I need my ticket winner. Could someone give me the ticket winner, please? All right, I gotta, I gotta, can I type it in there? All right, let me just put her name in here in the raffle. Uh, hold on one second. She is from, it's a woman. She's from New York. She is from the Meetup Group, for some of you that have been joining us in the Meetup Group. And her name is Teresa Wu. That congratulations. She's the winner of the $3,000 trading computer. But don't worry, we still have other packages we're going to be giving away. So make sure you check your emails. Teresa, congratulations. And hopefully you really enjoy it. <laughs> so for everybody that knows Teresa from the trader, um, she obviously came to see us at the meetup group. Uh, but for everyone else, thank you very much. Anyway, for everyone, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. I'd like to thank all my guests. I'd like to thank uh, everyone. Um, hold on, let me just bring it up here. Uh, Norman Hallett, Eddie Z for his contribution, Tom Busby, Boris, myself. Uh, we offered a lot of great uh, education, continue education at Cyber Trading University and to all theirs. And you have to make, you know, and once again, ladies and gentlemen, you have to make an effort. You need to get educated. I mean, there's only X amount of time that we could spend, all of us, for being here for the 45 minutes to kind of educate you one or two things. I know everyone here had learned something, something that is going to teach them to help modify their education. And sometimes showing you that you still need to learn a lot more, you know. So uh, no problem. I really, you did learn a lot, Jerome. Listen, you've always been a great student of ours and always enjoyed. Thank you for sticking around. I know it's been a long, long day. But hey, this is what, this is what we do for a living. And once again, this is not the only one we're going to be doing. Um, always look forward. We do events every single day. And, you know, one little quick comment. I, I did see somebody make a comment here regarding about getting free education. You know what's free? The cheese and the mousetrap. Brokerage firms, yes, they do get free education, but you've got to remember, they can only say so much but until they are not telling you what they can, what they want to tell you. There's a lot of compliance that comes along with it. That's why they want you to come to events like companies like Cyber Trade University. You know, so you have to remember, they can only tell you what they're allowed to tell you. You want to learn and know the strategies, the techniques, the games. Some of them are not really traders, so always, always, always remember that. Now, for, um, for some of you also, Remember, um, at Cybertrain University, we had the DVD set, and we also had that great package that we told you about the professional trading room. If you want to join our room, listen, this is one of the way I've learned how to trade is being part of a family, and being part of a family and being part of a group of people that are doing what I'm doing is the best way to start off and to learn. And for, like I said, for the, for the $10, uh, feel free to click on that link and register for that package. Um, like I said, it is a very, very, um, it's the cheapest trade you basically could make to, um, to be involved with professional traders that we run all day. So definitely get to try it out. You want the mouse pad? Listen, the mouse pad is there also. I, I, you know, it's our number one seller. People love that mouse pad. Uh, let me just give you the link if you need the mouse pad too, just, just in case. Uh, where is that mouse pad link? Uh, let me just bring it up for you. Mouse. There we go. I'll get to that mouse pad for you. There we go. Just copy and paste it. Yeah, we also even have the clock too. The clock on the wall. All right, everybody. Once again, from myself and everyone at Cybertrain University and all our guests at, uh, that were here today, 
would like to wish you all a happy and healthy and a great Saturday and like to thank you for coming and taking the time to stick around all the way to the end. And once again, I'd like to congratulate our raffle winner for the computer setup, um, Teresa Wu. Hopefully you will enjoy it. Uh, once again, everyone, thank you. If anyone has any questions, feel free to call us at Cybertree University, 516-280-5350. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful weekend, and hopefully see you all in our professional trading room and other upcoming events. Have a great day. Register today at www.cybertradinguniversity.com or call 877-70-CYBER 